Okay. Uh, ready to start? Kiran, you ready? Yes, I'm ready, Chris. Okay, excellent. Good day, y'all, and a hearty welcome, everyone, to CMA Australia's webinar. My name is Chris D'Souza, and I am the CFO as well as the CEO or international of CMA Australia. And once again, our event today is truly global in that it's being attended by nearly 500 participants from 32 countries across all continents. We are privileged to have with us today, Kiran Kelleher, a lifelong project management specialist with decades of experience in today's subject matter. Kiran commenced his working life in information technology, starting as a programmer, progressing to a business analyst, and then to project leader. Thus, to, this allowed Kiran to transition to the project, program, and portfolio management arena, where he developed and delivered training workshops, plus provided consulting services on these core principles and their supporting software packages. I have personally known Kiran for two decades now, and coincidentally, it was CMA which was responsible for this, for me getting to know Kiran. Uh, it's, the way it happened was CMA introduced me to a project management company called Primavera Australia, and I took over as their CFO. At, the, at that time, Kiran was the largest customer of Primavera. Later on, a couple of or two or three years later, he bought that company. He became the owner of the company, so pretty much my boss. And then we worked well together on the board of Primavera Australia when he sold the company, but since he sold, his, sold the company, he still remained my good friend. Over 20 years, I witnessed firsthand how Kiran has applied this philosophy of project management to both his personal life and his business. So what brings us together in this joint venture, if I can call it that, is our passion for today's subject. And we have worked together on bringing this webinar to you. So I welcome Kiran and request him to give give his opening remarks before I present my success philosophy of project management. Over to you, Kiran. Thanks, Chris, uh, for that introduction. And I'm honored to be the moderator for this webinar today. Uh, our topic is project management in a post-COVID world. And I suppose the way I see it is project management's about doing the project right and portfolio management is about doing the right projects. And it's something I've been passionate about for at least the last 30 years. Those two concepts are very important in my eyes, pre-COVID, but not everybody viewed them the same way as I did because we lived in a reasonably stable world. But they did become super important uh, during COVID when the whole world was thrown upside down and we were forced to do things differently. You know, one example, of course, is working from home. And we all had to become way more agile than we had in the past. And it's my belief that the world will apply them even more so, if, that's a, if that is possible, in a post-COVID world, especially those organisations that not only survived COVID, but blossomed due to it. So I believe these concepts are very important to every and any organisation, whether it be a government or private sector, whether it be a large organisation or a small organisation, a manufacturing organisation or a service provider or, or whatever other category. And as Chris alluded to, I've, I've also believed that concepts can be apply, sorry, applied to one's private life, arguably the most important project for all of us. I know Chris and I are on the same page with all of this, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to Chris to start his presentation. All right, let me share my screen. Here we go. All right. I guess you all can see my screen now and I'm about to start. All right. So project management in a post-COVID world, you know. Uh, our world today is undoubtedly going through an extremely difficult time. Many of us are grieving over the loss of near and dear ones. So first of all, on behalf of CMA Australia, our condolences and sympathies with those of you who have lost near and dear ones in the last year due to COVID. I know that we lost some of our CMA members, 
some of the family members of CMA members and a lot of friends. The global economy is also facing turbulent and uncertain times. Some of us are facing job losses as well as economic insecurity. As a result of COVID, many organizations are struggling. Some have collapsed and others are on the verge of collapse. Now, one year ago, in the middle of March 2020, I was in Dhaka and I had to prematurely cut short my overseas trip and rush home to Melbourne because all the countries were closing their borders. We had to cancel a large number of CMA programs as Australia and other countries were shutting their borders to combat COVID-19. Any prospect of international travel seemed bleak for years ahead. Back home, alone, in my room, in a, on a 14-day quarantine, the future looked bleak to me personally, as well as for CMA Australia. One year later, the world is still struggling to cope with COVID, and would be probably be an understatement to say that the future still looks turbulent and uncertain. But on a personal level, I am incredibly happy with the way I have navigated my life through these very tough times. I'm also happy with the way CMA Australia has navigated the crisis. So what's our secret? How did we do it? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Our secret, we have used the 6S philosophy of project management as our gliding philosophy. Me, in managing my personal and professional life through the COVID-19 times. And our management team here at CMA has also used a philosophical approach to project management to navigate the turbulent COVID storm, to remain afloat, and to emerge one year later as stronger and tougher organization ready to face the future. I like the sound of 6S. It sounds like success. So we can call this not just the success philosophy of project management, we can also call it the success philosophy of management. So it's the success philosophy of project management becomes the success philosophy of management. All right. So why do we need a philosophy? Let's look at that first. So before we look at the actual philosophy, let's see why do we need a philosophy project project management. As we all know, Management in general and project management in particular can be a Himalayan task requiring a Herculean effort. Often organizational management can look daunting and overwhelming when you look at it as a big thing to be done. But if you take a philosophical approach to the myriad of tasks to be performed, it makes the project's management more manageable. Later on, I will show you how this philosophy also applies to managing our busy lives of executives and our own personal lives. Now, the, this philosophy breaks this task of Herculean task to manageable levels. In my opinion, every manager and organization will greatly benefit from the conscious application to a, of a philosophical approach to project management. Conscious application does not require every manager to obtain a PMP certification in project management or to even read the 592 pages of the PM book. As I said before, the philosophy of project management extends project management principles to all areas of business life. Now, Kiran and I in particular look at our own lives as a project. And our life goes through a life cycle just like the project goes through a life cycle. Start at birth, initiated at birth, planned during the years of growth, executed throughout one's productive life, and the process of evaluation completion starts in the golden years of retirement and eventually closes off with death. So project management involves a why and a what and a how. Now the focus, now many firms use different methodologies during the four phases of the project cycle. Now that deals with the what and the how of project management. It is not the aim of this project of this webinar to talk about the what and how the methods of project management. We are going to talk about the why, to focus on the why. And what is the why does this why involve? Okay. A philosophical approach focuses on the strategic aspects of project management. Why do we undertake projects? So if you want to look at that, we should look at how all organizations achieve success by using product project portfolio management, something that Kiran is very good at. 
So what is project portfolio management? Organizations are required to regularly undertake multiple projects, the cumulative success of which is responsible for and results in the success of the organization as a whole. When I ask in my, uh, in my project management programs that I run, I ask participants what comes to mind when they think of projects. And most of them assume that projects are only take, undertaken in very big organizations, which builds build buildings, roads, airports, or such other undertakings. However, every organization, big or small, is required to regularly undertake multiple projects, the cumulative success of which is responsible for and results in the success of the organization as a whole. All the projects taken together constitute the project portfolio of the organization. So what we are looking at is project portfolio management, where projects taken together constitute the project portfolio of the organization. An organization, as I said, has limited resources and potentially an exceptionally large number of projects on its wish list. The first phase of project portfolio management called the design phase selects the projects which will enable an organization to achieve its strategic objectives. All right? So what we need to do when we select a project is to ensure that our projects which we select align with the strategic objectives of the organization. Here, I'm going to introduce you to Kiran's, uh, Kiran's philo philosophy of do or die. He came up with this key to organizational success. He said, do or die. The, he said the three, three phases of project management. Now, what are the three phases? He divided project management into three phases. Design, where you answer the question of why do you do a project, and you select the right projects. Then you have the what and the how, which is the implementation phase and the evaluation phase where you evaluate whether whatever you achieve by undertaking the product project, it was, a, it was what you plan to achieve uh, or does it still align with your organizational objectives? So uh, Kiran, is there anything that you'd like to add here on, the, on your DIE design, implement and evaluate? No, that's fine, Chris. Yep. All right, thanks. We go on. So now I will present to you my success philosophy of project management. Now, the success philosophy of project management for organizations developed over years of consulting work is summarized in the following six S's. I'll just name them first and we'll do a detailed explanation later. The first S is start, the second is stepped, the third is scalable, the fourth is systematic. The fifth is success oriented and the sixth is synergistic. All put together, you have a success philosophy of management. So let's see how we go about with that. So the success philosophy of first, we start at the beginning. Now Mark Twain said, the secret of getting ahead is getting started. That's obvious. And then he said, the secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks and then starting on the first one. As I explained earlier, often organizational management can look daunting and overwhelming when viewed as a whole. Thus, taking a philosophical approach to the myriad of tasks to be done makes every, any project or any management more manageable. So at the start, we look at breaking huge tasks to manageable tasks. And in the start, we also look at this aspect of design. As I said here, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And, and the design phase of it, we choose the right project. It's important, this phase, because here is where we choose the right project, not just getting do, in making sure that once a project is cho chosen, is implemented correctly, but we have to choose the right project. At the very start, you need to determine what impact do you want the project to have in your organization. Select the projects which will help your organization achieve their strategy. The wrong project, even if it is successfully implemented, has no impact on organizational success. So there's no, the point is get, getting the right project and implementing it right. If you have selected the wrong project, it's still not going to get you the results. So the, at the start, you look at designing projects which will align with your objective of the organization. So design phase selects projects that align with the organization's strategic objectives. That's the first part. 
the next is step okay after we have selected the right projects what we have to go about implementing the project in a stepped manner now step is defined or formed into a step of series of or series of steps carried out or occurring in stages or with pauses rather than continuously but with each step there is continuous improvement in the cma program we talk about in japan when toyota found their factory was taking 8 hours for gearbox manufacturing whereas the german company volkswagen was doing it in 4 hours so they sent their engineers to volkswagen on a project to find out how volkswagen could do it in 4 hours when they were taking 8 hours they came back and said okay we understood how to do it we can do it so they brought this step down to 4 hours and they were very happy but the management of toyota said great now you done it in 4 hours now let's see if you can bring it down to 2 hours so they did they worked hard they did repeated the same process because they had learned in the previous one they repeated the same process and they found they could do it in in 2 hours they celebrated that success but they said let's do better that's gone from 2 hours to 1 hour they kept on reducing the time till they brought down down for 3 minutes so 8 hours to 3 minutes it didn't happen in a shot they followed a step progress method from 8 hours to 4 hours 4 hours to 2 hours 2 hours to 1 hour and they kept reducing the time till they came down to 3 minutes as i said it's the product of continuous improvement so with each step there's continuous improvement and you focus on the small things focus on the small milestones as much as on the final destination if you focus too much on the destination at the start of the journey instead of focusing on making sure that you are taking the right steps and going the right direction there's a danger that you might reach the wrong destination take the famous example of boeing 737 max when the project to, was to develop the plane was completed and the aircraft was launched it was deemed to be a great success because the aircraft was launched within a very short period of time but in hindsight now we know that it was a failure i suggest that in focusing on getting the entire aircraft ready they lost focus on getting the little things right it's well known now that it was a failure of one of the smaller things the mks project that led to the huge problem that boeing is facing today so one project the the it was an important part a smaller part of the larger project that small part wasn't done right so that's why it's important that we follow a step approach keep focus on each small milestone on each co component as much as we do on the final one the next one is third s is scalable now here we are talk about the like you said the second s of the of the success philosophy of project man revolved around breaking up last task of achieving the strategic objective into smaller objectives it follows that most projects need to be repeated on a larger or smaller scale on an ongoing basis so it does not make sense to have to reinvent the wheel at the start of every project both at the design phase and the planning part of the implementation phase the element element of scalability needs to be kept in front and center of the process for example in uh, in the case study of cma australia discussed later in this article uh, in in the article that i have written on this topic when we designed the zoom program in march 2020 at the onset it was meant to be a small program delivered to a small group of participants from singapore so in march itself we had a, ran a small program but when we designed it we designed it to be scalable so from a small group of about 15 participants in singapore in march 2021 we were able to deliver the same program to a group of 102 participants across 20 countries so the scalability is important another good example that i like to give you is is of the of the webinar that you are viewing today now this webinar that you are viewing today is just a one hour program but it is scalable in a scalable in a sense now i have done an article on this i have written a paper on this which i'll give you reference to in the later stages from a from a paper i'm sure this can be converted into a book if i need to 
in the future. Like you can, each of these topics can be converted into a process oriented book. So this small project that I started off as a webinar is scalable upward. So whenever you do a project like that, most projects will need to be repeated on a larger or smaller scale on, on an ongoing basis. So you need to make sure that the, that the project is, is scalable as you do it. The fourth S is systematic. Now, systematic, here we come down to the actual implementation of the project. Now we move from portfolio management to systematically managing individual project, projects. And here we go through the life cycle of the project, from the initiation of the project, to planning of the project, to execution of the project, and completion of the project. So all of these, we do systematically. In this phase, we can go through the cafeteria I call uh, the PM book, the PM project management book of knowledge and carefully select the techniques and methodology required to successfully implement your project. In this process, you need to rely on your experience to make the appropriate selection. Now, I've, in the paper, I've given a lot of details about how you can do that. But here for this matter, here purpose, let me explain that this part of it deals with the what and the how. I said the philosophy as a whole deals with the deals with project management on a philosophical level, but the systematic manner in which you have to accomplish the project looks at the what and the how of the project. So here also, but while you're doing individual phase, now understand one thing here, that even when doing each of these individual parts of the project life cycle, initiation part, planning part, execution part, and completion part, each of these, you should still follow the philosophy. Make sure you are doing all of this in a stepped way, in a scalable way, systematically, in a success-oriented way, synergistic. So if you follow the philosophy, even in the individual parts, it will be really helpful in project management, making sure that this, it's done systematically as well. Right. The fifth test is success-oriented. Now, before we undertake any project, we ask the question, why you undertake the project? It should be only undertaken if it contributes to attaining the strategic objective of the organization. A right project successfully implemented can be termed to be successful. Now, projects should be success oriented at two levels. So what are the two levels of, of at, at two levels? One is, one is the, at the implementation level, and I will explain later at the other one, it should be successful at the impact level. I'll explain that in a second. But first, let's look at how you can, the aim technique in crisis management and beyond. So what happens is basically we talk about project success, but not all projects are successful because not all projects can take, in projects, think in the middle of projects, what happens? Something like COVID-19 can come in the way. COVID-19 is just one example, but you could have various other unforeseen circumstances that happen. And here we come up with the AIM technique in crisis management. Again, the AIM technique is something that Kiran has developed. AIM stands for abolish, influence, and monitor technique. Abolish, influence, and monitor. Abolish, if one can, can we abolish the crisis? Now, in the case of COVID-19, it's not possible in the short run to abolish the crisis. So if you cannot abolish the crisis, you cannot get, the best thing to do is to get rid of the crisis. Can you get rid of the crisis? If you cannot abolish it, you try to influence it. Okay? You try to make sure that it doesn't come, come in the way of the management. A lot of companies and people did that during COVID-19. They couldn't abolish it, but they tried to influence it, make sure that they make the best of the situation. And if you cannot abolish and influence it, what you do is monitor. If you cannot abolish and influence, what you do is you work, you, you still in, increase the likelihood of success by monitoring what's, how you can manage around the crisis. Kiran, anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, I just might add, Chris, that um, that's in decreasing order. So the reason, I'll tell a second, I'll just put my video on so I can bear with me. Come on. Yeah. The, 
the, the best thing to do if you can is to abolish it because if you abolish a risk or an external factor that just increases the probability of success but as you said not everything can be abolished you can't always do things to abolish an external factor or a risk so that that's why if you can't do that you then try to influence it um, and a classic case of influencing it is um, is where, for example, a project or a program or whatever might be delivering some, some um, outputs, and but they, you might be, say, for example, a government project might be, look, okay, take, let's take COVID, COVID vaccination. One of the risks with that or is that people might not take up um, uh, the vaccination for whatever reasons, because it's, it's a purely a personal decision. So what you'll see governments do is, It'll run program, yeah, you know, advertising programs or marketing programs or you know, information sessions, trying to influence people to take up the vaccination. But if and if you can't do influence, well, then the very least and you must do is monitor it. So if you're monitoring it, it and things are going astray, that's a time when maybe that project should be culled or at least suspended. Because why keep doing the project knowing that a risk is going to derail it and you're not going to achieve the deliverables? or you may not even achieve the, the impact you're looking for. So it's a project that you know, an organisation should consider culling it, or as I said, suspending it for maybe a bit of time. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Thanks for that explanation, Kiran. Thank you. So, so then I, we, we come down to, when you come down to project evaluation, ask the question, why do projects fail? Like our aim is to, to be successful, that should be. So projects fail on two levels, as I was saying, there could be an implementation failure and there could be a impact failure. Implementation failure is when projects do not achieve the objective that they were meant to achieve. And impact failure is even though there's a project is implemented successfully, it doesn't have the desired impact on the, uh, on the organizational objectives. So on an implementation level, project failure occurs due to the failure in one or more of the key aspects of project management, which, I have, which we have, like there could be project, project failure due to cost management, project failure due to time management, and project fail, failure due to quality management or scope management. So in that sense, you could say that your, your project has, gone, uh, has cost too much, so that's why it's an implementation failure. Or you could say your core project has not been completed within the... Uh, given amount of time, therefore it's an implementation failure. But even if a project is an implementation failure, it can still have the correct impact. So though it has cost more than you scheduled, or it has taken more time than you scheduled, you can still say that this project was success from the impact point of view. From the strategy point of view, it was a success. So it was strategic success, though implementation failure. So that's better actually, as Kiran would agree with me, that it's better to have a project which, I mean, ideally we would like to have a project which is a success on implementation and impact level, but, but if you have a project which is even, which fails on the implementation level, level but succeeds on the impact level, that's still better than having a, a project which you implement perfectly on time at the cost, with you, but at the end of the project, you find that it has had no, no, not the desired impact on the objective of the organization. Because eventually the reason why, as I said, we are talking about the why, why did we do the project? We did the project because it aligned with our organizational, organizational objective. It, has, it was supposed to impact the organizational impact, uh, objectives. It did not, therefore it was not a success in that sense. Right. So when you're looking at success orientation, we look at both that it's an implementation success as well as a strategic success. So we are looking at both of these things, implementation success as well as strategic success. Now, the final success, sixth S is synergize, right? The sixth S synergize. Now, if you, this picture, you can see a series of pictures on your screen. Now, these are pictures I've taken in a, in an Irish town called uh, Donegal. And I took a this picture, There's, it, was, it was an autumn before COVID. And uh, there's some typical houses there, a little stream there. Now, each of these pictures is okay by itself. But when you look at the final picture put together, that's how it looks like. So all of them, individual pictures don't give as much of an impact 
as the whole put together okay now for example we do the cma program each we have we have 24 topics in the cma program now that each of those topics is a fantastic wealth of knowledge each of the topics but it's only when they are put together in the form of the cma program that you get the complete picture strategic picture which allows you to be to become a certified management accountant or cma so therefore you have a lot of individual products uh, projects but you must make sure that when they when they combine together the the benefits that they give you is far greater than the individual the sum of the individual parts of it so they you have to look at the overall picture or how much impact that the or the, the projects are going to have on the on the organization as a whole All right that's synergize so that's the success now let's look at a project success in covid world the cma australia we did a as a case study how did we apply this in our thing so what we did when as i said is that how will we achieve project management philosophies when we apply the success philosophy of project management to tackle the problem we systematically last year when covid started we systematically embarked on multiple small and sensible projects some of these projects were as follows we got the cma program first of all i explained earlier ready to run as a zoom program instead of face to face it was never meant to be a zoom program but we got it ready we updated all our study material we brought in the latest included zoom including the lessons we had learned from the covid crisis we updated our study material all of it we uh, we had a project separately to make sure that our organization functioned seamlessly uh, with work from home capabilities we started special webinars to engage members because we couldn't do face to face uh, uh, symposiums and seminars anymore we started research project projects like the global like the grid index which i initiated then we had the redevelopment of the website as part of it we had a cash them young project where we encourage student members to become like become members as student members and then we had a global zoom project so all of these little things to put together helped us to become much a bigger and better stronger organization so that is how we as cm australia use the success philosophy to achieve success during this covid times now this same philosophy can be used not just in and a work level but also to attain a work life balance now if you look at the all of us our well being doesn't require only only money it's not only based on finance it looks at physical emotional spiritual social and professional all put together makes us a balanced thing so we many people more people should you so the idea is that the more you use this philosophy to to achieve your uh, so each of these things financial physical professional each of these can be used as an as a project of its own for example you know when you look at life as a whole sometimes it can look overwhelming and daunting but we if any break our life down to small projects we can we can achieve great success like if you you take financial success you want to have financial success you see you can do a project to make sure that your now for instance in the uh, i'm getting into a planning for retirement at the moment and i'm breaking my i'm planning to start a pension scheme for myself which we can do here in australia and it's a two year project that i've started so it it, it goes on to from phase 1 to phase 6 i've broken that up into project and i'm sure at the end of that i will have laid out my pension scheme well for my retirement now physically if you look at it look at, you can have physically you can have uh, various projects like uh, you want to reduce your weight maybe you want to uh, improve your cholesterol levels so each of these you can take up if you if you look at the whole thing and say oh i'm not feeling well and you got have problems if you look at that sort of thing it seems that you don't know where to start and what to do but if you break that down into small well being projects like personally for example when i came back from my tasmanian holiday in in january i was i felt really overweight i was uh, weighing something like 
12 kilos more than what I'm weighing today. So I came, started a project, essentially I started a project to reduce my weight. And um, over a period of four months, I lost 12 kilos. And how I did that is not just randomly, but planning it well. Every week I started a weekly program for weight reduction and it was successful. Over a period of four months, I did lose 12 kilos from um, 76 down to 64. So that was quite, quite a good result. So we can, you have, you can manage all of your personal life using the same method. Okay, so that's how you do it. So the two take kit, now these you would say, these are all, they, they are, uh, I mean, common sense, everyone knows that. But the key thing to remember here is deliberate conscious application. The two key takeaways, first of all, you take the small step philosophy, like break it down, whatever you want to achieve, break it down into small steps, and then you apply this in a conscious manner. Now, if I just decide that I will just do it and not start application in a conscious manner, you probably won't achieve the success you would otherwise do, right? So project management and management both are interconnected. So this success philosophy of project management is also a success philosophy of management in general. Now, project management and because every, as I said, all organizations have projects ongoing at every given time. So as I said before, they are linked together like the famous song from Frank Sinatra. You can't have one without the other. You can't have project management and, uh, as distribution from organizational management. They are linked together like love and marriage, horse and carriage. This, this is a famous song from uh, Frank Sinatra that I think of when I say that, okay? And to summarize, I'd say that nothing is, in the words of Henry Ford, nothing is particularly hard if you divide it into small jobs. I could conclude by paraphrasing the above quote of the greatest inventor of the 19th century to say that nothing is particularly unachievable if you divide it into small achievable projects. So we can divide our all our major tasks into small achievable projects and we can complete them. And in doing that, you can go through the my success philosophy. Now, I've given that this was really a very little time to condense everything that I wanted to say, I have written an article, a paper on this subject. So if you go on to our website, uh, CMA website, and uh, you look at this HD, uh, this shown here, uh, cmaaustralia.edu.au slash on target, you will see right at the beginning there, you have a success philosophy of project management. And it's a detailed paper on exactly what I've tried to condense into this half an hour today. All of that is given much more in detail over there. So I encourage you to go on to the website. If you can't find the website, you can look at my LinkedIn profile. I'll be putting a link, link in there for the, for the website and to the thing. As also, I will be putting it on, it'll be on the CMA Australia page on LinkedIn as well, right? So now if you, this was just 30 minutes to, to cover a very, uh, pretty much of a difficult thing to cover in, 20, in 30 minutes. We also run a program called Certified Analyst in Project Management for one day and the next day you do a Certified Analyst in Project Finance which Professor Janak runs along with me. So these two together could give you a lot more information. If you are more, have more interest in learning about this, this is what it is. And if you want everything, then in September, 2021, we are running a program, CMA Australia is running a program called uh, for, uh, for seven days. The dates are given there again, if you are interested, these details are on our website, or also you can send an email to, for any of these matters, you can send an email to info at cmaweblind.edu.au and you'll get information. Uh, I'll sign off with that and hand over to Kiran. I'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to Kiran to give his concluding remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for that uh, great presentation. Um, as I sit here and I, li and I listen and I watch, um, from my perspective, I think there's three key takeaways from today's webinar. The first one is the success philosophy of project management. Number one being the start, going to step, scalable, systematic, success orientated, and I always get this one wrong, but synergistic. And, and you cover those in a lot a lot of detail during the presentation. And obviously it takes more than that to actually deep, deep into them. 
Um, so I won't go any further into those. The other two takeaways is, and maybe um, trying to explain on those a bit more, is the AIM or the aim for handling risk and external factors. And it just came to me um, as you were talking that I'm doing a project at the moment where um, we're doing a kitchen um, uh, renovation. And if we did this project prior to COVID coming along, um, and, and we're putting in things like, you know, stoves and cooktops and ovens and all that sort of stuff, I probably would have stuck with the, you know, the just-in-time supply principle, um, and I would have just built a, a relationship with the supplier, which is the influence of the AIM. I try and, you know, have that good relationship. But given the way the world is now and delivery times are out the door, I would probably now, and we are doing it now, and this is what we did do, was we abolished that risk of having supplies held up. So what we had is a little project at the front where we bought all the kitchen appliances. So when we actually did the kitchen renovation, we weren't going to be held up by, um, by, by the, you know, the delays in getting supply, uh, those materials or those appliances to us. And that's, and that's why at any one time on any one project, there's no right or wrong answer with this. You have to think about um, what's the chance of this risk occurring What's the chance of it derailing the project? And um, so then that's why the AIM is there. It's, you know, the abolish can be a very expensive one to do, potentially, depending on what the risk is. Influence is, is maybe less, less costly and monitor maybe the least costly. But once again, it's about the success of the project. So, and, and as you said in your presentation, you know, prior to COVID, one of the major causes of projects failing was that organisations probably didn't pay enough attention to those things, the risk and external factors. I know that PMBOK has a whole element on risk management and talks about risk analysis, but um, for a lot of, I suppose, organisation internal projects, maybe that, that rigour isn't applied. And I think in the COVID world, in the post-COVID world, it's even more crucial now that organisations give focus to that. And I just gave that example about the kitchen because um, our project would probably take us, instead of taking a couple of months, could take us a year and once again, blow budgets and blow time and all those sorts of things. And I'd end up with a pretty unhappy partner. So, um, so yeah, so otherwise, if we're going to see more, if we don't do this, my concern with organisations, just go back to the business world, is that um, we're going to see more failed projects. And either they'll fail because they didn't produce the deliverables or the outputs, which is what you call the what, or they failed to achieve the impact or the outcome that it was aligning with those strategic objectives. It doesn't, doesn't matter which, at which level they fail. It really is the waste of a scarce resource that we all call money. No organisation has enough or more money than they can to do all the projects they'd like to do. So that's the second takeaway. The third takeaway, and this probably is my, this is my favourite, is that D-I-E or die. And once again, just to elaborate on that, um, die is a, is a plural for dice. And that's what, um, if you go to a casino, you'll see people playing a game of chance um, with, with the dice or dies. And with projects, we all know that outputs and outcomes or deliverables and impact are never guaranteed. There's a chance that they may fail. So that's the, sort of a, a negative view of the word die. I like to use a more positive view, which is in manufacturing, a die is a template for successfully producing the same item over and over again. And that's what we're seeking here with a template for success so that projects are successful over and over again, whether it be an IT project or a marketing project or whatever. We improve our, there's no guarantee of success, but um, we just want, we're aiming to increase, uh, increase the chances of us being successful. And as you mentioned, Chris, you know, if, if we don't do this, this um, DIE, um, basically the chances are that projects will continue to fail at the output level or even worse at the outcome level. And then, and that maybe then causes organizations to suffer financially or, or lose market share or whatever. And so just to sort of the last couple of comments was just remember in your own life, none of us have enough money and no organization I know, even government agencies that I work with will ever have enough money to undertake all the projects that they would like to do. So in today's uncertain world, and I think to, you know, tomorrow's world is going to be much the same, 
you know, we live in this sort of uncertain and dynamic world. And so it's critical that not only are we doing the projects right, which is where project management and the PMBOK and all that sort of stuff is aimed at, we've really got to ensure we're doing the right projects, which is the portfolio management. That's what's going to guarantee the success for our, for our organisations that we work with. So without any further ado, Chris, that's my summary of, of what you've covered today. And I've added a bit more to it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kiran. We've got a few questions and uh, I'd just like to remind everyone that I should have said this in the beginning, but somehow I forgot to tell you guys that uh, please type in the questions uh, into the Q&A box and we'll attempt to answer them. So uh, the floor is open for all of you to ask questions. So please type them into the Q&A box. The first, uh, first one is a little bit humorous. It mm -hmm. says uh, implementation with impact example the wedding was a disaster because the ceremony didn't go off very well. There was maybe the rain during the party, God knows. Implementation failure, but the honeymoon was great. So the successful impact. Would you agree with that, uh, <laughs> Kiran? I was going to say, you'll probably go the other way. Maybe the wedding was great, which is implementation success, but the, <laughs> the, but the, but the marriage failed, which is really, it's, it's, just, it's a different view of the same, same comment, yes. So. It's true, yes. You can look at it both ways. Yeah, true. Both ways, yeah. yeah. Uh, the second question is, are there, are there two more S's? That's Prof. Janak is asking. Are there two more S's? Uh, uh, sustainable and spiritual. Uh, sustainable in the sense uh, you must think about the environment. And the spiritual, it must be ethical. Uh, you can add a lot of S's. Uh, my comment would be you can add a lot of S's to the thing, but I think the... Uh, taken uh, uh, this, that sustainable and spiritual are the, broader in the sense to whatever we do in your organization, like you can see the sustainable value creators, we have made that as our logo. So I know CMA believes in sustainability. Anything to add to that, Kira? I, I'm thinking my view would be, and, and uh, is that both of those are probably S's at the next level. I mean, boards should not be approving programs or portfolio of works unless they do the right thing by the environment, as in, and not only sustainable for the environment, but obviously sustainable for the company. But also, I think these days, organisations are getting a lot smarter now and thinking about the ethical side of business. Um, by the time you get it down to the project management level, that can still apply. But I think it's more important that the impact or the outcome is you know, ethical. Is It's not only the, only the deliverables or the outcome. Uh, sorry, the deliverables or the outputs, I should say. Yeah. Uh, there is one question here, which is, uh, I'll read it out, Kiran, because it's, he, I, I understand what's happened here. Uh, he, it's coming as three questions, but it's actually one question. Uh, it says here, Chris mentioned about, uh, from Ivan, he says, Chris mentioned about Boeing, and we have another example of Australia post-performance during COVID pandemic, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Say you have a fabulous philosophy, how do you preserve that value, valuable philosophy when, uh, when there's a change in leadership? Yeah, so so how do you like, I think the Australia Post question goes to that, like, uh, suppose you have a good philosophy, but you know, the change in leadership, I don't know whether they had a good philosophy to start with, but uh, Boeing and, and um, Boeing and as well as Australia Post are examples of failure on the impact level, I think. Um, so Kiran, what do you need to add to that? You please uh, give your take yeah. on that. Yeah. Well, but, but I think I'm a bit like you, Chris, is you know, if you have a change at the senior level, maybe the philosophy has to change. And I'm thinking, I'll give you another example, which is when I own shares in this organisation to my detriment, uh, hasn't helped my retirement but um, funding, but um, AMP, you know, at, at the end of the day, AMP is really changing um, or trying to change what they did in the past to be, and, and I think really what they have to do is change, not only change the board, but they actually need to change the philosophy. But the issue, I suppose, is what, is what um, that question is alluding to is what happens if you have a really valuable philosophy and someone comes along and, and derails it? I think that's what's happened to AMP as well. They've had, had people who actually derail the organisation through bad, so through a change of philosophy, which turned out to be not the right one. So, yeah. Uh, the next one is, uh, is, uh, where is it going? Uh, from Nicole. How will you know if your plan should either be abolished or just pushed back if you personally gave yourself a deadline or along the way it seemed 
the end goal is not going to be achieved. That's something you can look at, you know? It's yeah, right. Nicole, that's a great question because there's not too many organisations I've worked with where they're happy to um, uh, you know, abolish a project or, or, or even suspend a project. I think that because funding um, has been granted to a project, you should see it through to the end, even though it's it might be maybe the and you've alluded to this, Chris, is maybe the project's been being done right. You've got a really good project manager doing a project, but you get either part of the way through the project or at the end of the project, and it was actually the wrong project. My my view is, and I, this is a tough one, is that the, the, the sooner you can stop doing wrong things as an organisation, in other words, a project that's not going to achieve the success that you're, um, you're, you, you're wishing for or seeking, the sooner you can, you can cull that project. I don't like using the word kill, so I'll use the word cull, um, the better it is for the organisation. But I totally agree. That's not easy. Um, but I think that's that to me is a mature organisation who understands what's you know where they're heading and why they're on on this um, you know what, why they're in in business and what they why they they are there to, and they'll grow because of it because as I said before no organisation I've ever been involved in has enough money to do all the projects they'd like to do so why are you wasting money on a project that's not going to produce the deliverables or the outputs or not have the impact there must be other projects that are better to work on and I think COVID was a great example where a lot of projects should would have got derailed and should have been canned or culled or suspended, but I don't, yeah, you know, probably not, probably not of that, not enough of that happened in reality because we're worrying about other things at the time. But yeah, good question. Thanks, thanks, Kiran. Uh, the next one, the comment, and I think it's it's going take, going back to our uh, the uh, our example of marriage, <laughs> and <laughs> it's a very funny comment from. Our good old Professor Janak, he says, throwing all the money in the world cannot fix a badly implemented project. Yep. Uh, example, Bill Gates' marriage. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Professor Janak. That's a good <laughs> example. Uh, all the money in the billions of dollars could not fix a badly implemented project, which is a marriage. You can make jokes about it now. Nobody really knows what happened there anyway. <laughs> Time, cost, benefit analysis. Way do how we do how uh, in COVID-19. So how do you do this? How do you weigh the time cost benefit analysis during COVID-19? Like what's your view, Kiran? Yeah, once again, another good question. And I think, I think what the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is they're alluding to here is the world's got far more dynamic now than it ever did before, where some of these things like working at the time and the cost and the benefit of project takes time, um, is that yeah, I've, I've heard that there's another school of thought, which is, you know, the ready, aim, fire, which is, you know, it's sort of like a military idea, is there's also another concept which is being a far more agile and which is ready, yeah, so instead of saying ready, fire, sorry, ready, aim, fire, go ready, fire, and then aim. In other words, being far more agile and basically getting your missiles in the air and then work out which target you go for. And I think you probably need a combination of both of those at the moment, because if you sit there and, and get down by, you know, analysis by uh, paralysis by analysis, nothing will ever get done. Um, so sometimes I think you just got to give it a go. And it's a bit of both. And I think that's where you need leadership from the top, which sort of says that, right? There. Uh, that's, that's about the only comment I can make there. Yep. Excellent. Thanks, Kiran. The next one is directly to you, I think, Kiran. It's your, your te technique of AIM technique. Would you please explain further uh, uh, the AIM technique in crisis management? So, it was, it's really not crisis management unless you call the crisis as a risk. Um, it's what, and once again, I, <laughs> I could run a two day workshop on this, which I haven't got time for, but the idea behind it is um, you have a hierarchy of objectives starting at the strategy at the top level. And in any organisation, you know, the senior management set those, those strategies and that should cascade down into um, impacts or um, uh, outcomes. Some people use you know, those words interchangeably. And down at the project level, you have outputs and then further down into activities and sub-activities. Um, wh what the concept behind the AIM is, to go from a, an activity to an output, you need an external factor to be in the positive to get you there. Otherwise, you have a, they're saying the same thing. And same with, and I'll give an example in a minute, same thing with output or deliverables going to an impact. 
And the one I used, I covered a lot in the workshops when I run them is, is I'm not too sure whether all our friends around the globe have this issue, but in Australia, we have police with speed cameras. And the idea behind speed cameras is, I always ask people, why do we have speed cameras? And a lot of people will just make the comment, um, it's because you know, the government's trying to raise revenue. Well, that may or may not be true, but others will say it's about improving road safety. So the reason you need to analyze it then is, if you're, if you're trying to raise a lot of money, what you'll want to do is pick spots to put speed cameras in where people speed, but there's not many accidents. Whereas if you're trying to uh, increase road safety, you'll pick a, a location to put speed cameras in where there's a lot of accidents of people getting injured or, or dying. So that's where that AIM comes into it. So it's about which locations, in, in some cases, you know, when I could be the, in charge of the project, um, buying the cameras and training the police, but there might be an engineering project which goes out there to pick these locations. And the risk for me is if they pick the wrong locations, we won't achieve the outcome we're looking for. And that's where that would be trying to influence the locations and understanding what the, um, what the issue, you know, what the, what the outcome you're looking for is. That makes sense. So it's not really crisis management. It's more about handling the risk or external factors outside your control. Right. How about risk control on impact of future pandemics? I mean, <laughs> we should have, we should have learned enough about managing during COVID to be able to take care of a few pandemics if they come. I hope they don't come any more pandemics, but. Yeah, but I think what it does has done is, is it, a lot of organizations have been caught, Chris, with um, um, out. And I think risk now will become a bigger um, item on the agenda for, for people saying, hey, we can go, we've got the expertise to do these projects or whatever, but what's the chances of us getting the outcomes we're looking for, which is part of that whole risk management, risk identification, probability. Um, if, yeah, at the project level, you can read the risk element in or risk management element in the PMBOK, and it's yeah, it's very very thick and very uh, precise. But um, but I think a lot of other people go away and just I've, I've been in, I've seen projects where people did a really good job, but had no no impact on the organisation, and it's normally an external factor that's stop them from getting to that. And that's the, the stuff we're talking about here. Thanks for that, Kiran. Uh, one, uh, last couple of questions. One of the, we are almost out of time, but one of the greatest challenges management accountants face today is reasonably acceptable forecasting. Is there some advice you can give us to help the profession to sharpen the forecasting skills? Uh, I have a couple of ideas, but go ahead. Yeah, have... I'll leave it to you, Chris. You're an accountant. Okay, well, <laughs> Today, I mean, technology is the is what's driving forecasting these days. The, uh, today, we are looking at uh, uh, data sciences, data scientists, and uh, analysis, which can actually tell you to help you a lot with forecasting. Like, if you're a website and you know how much of hits you're getting on the website, there is almost a correlation between the amount of hits you get on the website to the, your sales. You know. The last company I worked with, they had actually a measure of forecasting that certain percentage of hits to the website uh, result in this. How do you ensure you get hits to the website? Pay a lot of money to Google and they get you people on your website. So things like that. So there are forecasting. I mean, that's one type of forecasting, but this data scientist uh, science is very great, uh, good in helping forecasting. What, what do you think, Kiran? Yeah, I think the other thing too is that I think most people understand that early in, in the period, yeah, your estimate might be or your forecast might be plus or minus, you know, say 30%. And as you then take it down into the project level, I mean, the problem I've seen in some organisations is if you come up with a budget and I've, yeah, you might have a budget on a big project with say 10 million and that's a, a, a plus or minus 30% estimate, but that becomes the budget, right? And it's locked in. Um, people of management and people need to understand that, hey, in those early phases, it's about, hey, we think it's going to be 10 million. And then um, as if, if we've got the funding to sort of go further with it, but as you get to the down to the start of the project, even then, if you come up with a budget of, you know, say 8 million, it's still not 8 million, it's 8 million plus or minus a smaller percentage. So it's, it's un, you know, being, having that maturity around that is what I think is part of, yeah, would help in that regards. 
how can we overcome the i think we should uh, end with the last this question because uh, we have, we got we keep getting questions otherwise um, how can we overcome the post covid situation for construction sector project implementation labor management and time management how do we control or manage the supply chain additional cost in the post covid era <laughs> Well, I, th I think I alluded to the supply chain problem with I had in my little project where, you know, and I, I'm not saying that's the answer to every project, but these are risks that you need to consider. You know, what if we can't get the labour? Uh, and I know, I'm, and, and it's, I'm sure all the countries have the same problems with this at the moment with locked borders or um, lockdowns is that you may not be able to get the right labour. I know there's a big labour shortage in Australia. Um, it's, uh, and it may be the best thing that it was, stop the project or suspend the project or don't start the project until a more appropriate time because there's no way I mean, we're talking they're a construction project you may be able to do the you know the clearing but you can't go any further so you're just going to have all that land sitting there cleared but can't go any further so maybe the smart and i know this is hard to do the smart thing to do but maybe just say hey let's put that project on hold until things are better for us um, or you go the other way with the supply chain stuff is how about we have a a sub project the front which is to purchase everything so we know that it's all in house and then we can go uh, and do that but once again that <coughs> increases the cost because you've got holding costs um i i just think for the next few years you know jit which is you know just in time uh, supply or purchasing is is probably going to be something that was done in the past but, but yeah but it'll be i think it'll be off the off the it would, would be something we won't come back to for some time until the world settles down, whatever that might be. Yeah, I think I'll end, end with the last couple of comments. We are just out of time. So uh, first comment, first is say that uh, question, and I can say in one, one sentence, can you follow the Japanese uh, management system Kaizen on project management? Yes, we mm. can. And uh, more details, if you'd like to read the article, uh, which uh, the details are already there. And the final comment is uh, that I think the six S is great. The first S must be start, but the rest the, don't have to go in that order. For example, you might put scalable last, or you might look around. I agree with that. Uh, you don't have to go in the order. You follow all of the six. <clears throat> you make sure you cover all of the six S's and it, it should always be scalable. It should always be step. It should always have be systematic. It should always be, uh, um, uh, synergist, synergized and success. <coughs> so as long as you cover all the bases, it doesn't matter in what order you correct, uh, uh, correct it. And uh, to end off, I will read the last comment again, which is thank you, Dr. Chris and Kiran for answering my questions and for valuable guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for attending the program. And thanks, Kiran. Yep. Uh, a big thank you to you from CME Australia and all of us here for uh, joining us and giving us your valuable uh, insights, uh, especially coming from a project management specialist. It's great. And I would like to tell all of you that Kiran has, uh, uh, has given his blessings to my article. So if you're more interested in the article, please go read it. He's uh, pretty happy with the end result. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kiran. Thanks, Thanks uh, Chris. Thanks to all of you for all participants from all 40 countries for joining in. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.